Good morning. This week we are starting a new series called Exploring Mark, and I hope that if you haven't already that you will uh, grab a bookmark out on the table uh, in the entryway, and I hope that you'll grab one of those and read along with us. It's just a chapter or two every week that you just got to kind of read just so you know where we're at in the gospel, and hopefully uh, the Lord will speak uh, to you as you read that and point things out that maybe I can't get to uh, in my sermons And so I hope that you will uh, do that. As we look today, our uh, sermon is called, uh, Called. And uh, today, I want to kind of hit on the fact that everyone wants to be wanted. Everyone wants to be wanted. We all want someone to want us. In fact, there was a, uh, this is obviously uh, relevant in relationships. We want someone to show that they make an effort, that they actually want us, they want to be with us. It's just not enough that someone's going through the motions. We want them to actually want us. In fact, you guys might know the song. I'm not going to sing it because I can't sing, but uh, I want you to want me. I need you to need me. You might have heard that song before, and it rings true. We want someone to want us. We need someone to need us. In fact, uh, well, I think we always want to be wanted, but unfortunately we don't always want to do what the next step is. And that, that's the fact that there's some sort of expectation on our part if we are wanted. There's some sort of reciprocal nature that we need to give back whenever someone actually does want us. And today in our scripture we see that Jesus wanted the disciples. He was calling for them, and Jesus wants us and is calling for us, but he doesn't just sit there and want nothing to happen from that. He expects something. He expected something from the disciples, and he expects something from us. It's not just a one-way street with Jesus pouring everything in. There is something that he is asking for in return. And so if you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 1. It'll be up on the screen if you don't have your Bibles with you, but Mark chapter 1, verse 16 through 20. And it says this, Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he, that's Jesus, saw Simon, who you'll be familiar later on, the Simon is uh, Peter, if you're not familiar, but Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with their hired servants and followed him. You see, people want to be wanted But whenever they saw they want to be wanted, Jesus didn't just say, I want you. He called them to something. And the first thing that he called them to today is that he called them to follow. He called them to follow. We are called to follow Jesus and Jesus alone. We are called to follow after him. Now, there's something important to note on this, on this whole uh, being called issue If you're someone who tends to be running on a little on the insecure side and doubting yourself, Jesus wanted the unwanted. He called the people that no one else was calling. You see, the disciples, we have to understand kind of their background. We have to understand where they were coming from. And so these disciples were in a trade. They were fishermen, all four of these that were called here in Mark chapter 1. And we have to understand that any good Jewish boy didn't want to be a fisherman when he grew up. That wasn't what he aspired to. Even if it's what he grew up doing because his father did it and it's what he knew, he aspired to be something more. Because in the Jewish culture, the ultimate sign of respect and the ultimate thing that you could be is a rabbi. And so what every good Jewish boy wanted to be is he wanted to be good enough to be a rabbi. And to be good enough to be a rabbi, that meant you had to be a follower of a rabbi. Because all Jewish boys would go to school until they're about 12 years old and learn scripture. And the best of the best were chosen to be disciples. They were chosen to be disciples of a rabbi and they would start learning under this rabbi, and eventually become rabbis themselves. And that's what every good Jewish boy wanted. And the fact that these are grown men 
fishermen means they were not the best of the best. In fact, they were the unwanted. The people that weren't good enough. They weren't good enough to make the final cut. And so this means that that no one really wanted them. But, so when Jesus came along and they were a little later in life and Jesus wanted them, this is why they jumped to the calling. Because there's still that little part in them that said, I want to be wanted. And all of a sudden this rabbi came along and said, I want you to follow me. And so they jumped at it. These were not especially intelligent or especially gifted people. These were not the cream of the crop. These were not the people that we would have expected, but Jesus chose them even despite of their lack of giftedness. Jesus chose them even though they may have not been the most intelligent because Jesus wanted to do amazing things through them. And so he chose the people that needed him the most. So we have Peter, or called Simon here in this text, and Andrew and James and John, these uneducated hillbilly fishermen from the north in Galilee. And hillbilly is the correct word there. In fact, in Acts, whenever they start speaking, people are shocked that they're speaking so well because they're like, aren't these those Galileans? The reason why they're saying that is that's the equivalent of us saying, does this hillbilly really know what he's talking about? This guy from Appalachia? That's how they viewed the Galileans, the people down in Jerusalem. They viewed them as the backwater hicks that no one really respected. And so whenever we see that these were the people that Jesus chose, it seems a little bit shocking. It seems a little bit like, why in the world would he do this? And so for those of you that are insecure, remember this. If you're ever thinking that you're not gifted enough, remember that Jesus wants the unwanted. Jesus doesn't want you because of what you have. He wants you because of what he can do through you. And so he wants to work through you, but you have to be willing to follow. You have to be willing to follow him to show that you are committed. Now, there is another aspect to this following, and that's for others of you that may not, maybe aren't insecure, maybe not in doubt of your abilities, but maybe you're kind of on the opposite end. Maybe you tend to run a little more arrogant or prideful. And Paul actually addresses this in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 12. And even though Paul was uh, learned humility, I do believe that Paul had a struggle with sometimes thinking uh, more of himself than maybe he ought. And he realized that he just saw himself for who he truly was because he was a very intelligent person. He was the cream of the crop. In fact, in one passage, he actually says that he was the Pharisee of the Pharisees, the Jew of the Jews, meaning he was the best of the best. So if any knows one, one knows what he's talking about, about Scripture, it's Paul. Yet Paul has these insightful words for us in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, in verses 9 through 10. He says this, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecution, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So we have this person who in one text is saying, I am the best of the best. But in another text, he says, I will boast in my struggles and my weaknesses because I know that's when Jesus is shining through. And so we have someone who understands that even though we may struggle with something, that the glory does not belong to us, but the glory belongs to God. So if you are one of those ones that thinks maybe a little more highly of yourself than you should, and you see the giftedness that you have, and maybe you're just honest with yourself, you know you are gifted in an area, God still wants to use those gifts. But remember who gifted them to you. Remember who gave them to you. And remember that your weaknesses can still be used by God. All that we have that is good is from God. And whenever he calls us to follow him, he calls us to use those abilities for him. In John 14, verse 15, it says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. 
You see, if you love Jesus, you will do what he says and you'll use your abilities for him. In fact, it's important to note that sometimes whenever we're children, when we first become a Christian because we're afraid of hell. But if you're an adult and you're trying to mature in your faith and that's still the reason you follow Jesus, then your faith has not really matured past that of an infant. Because there comes a point where you no longer do what Jesus says because you're afraid. You do what Jesus says because you love him. So out of, Jesus, out of love for Jesus, you follow Scripture, not because you're afraid of what might happen if you don't, but just because you love Jesus so much, you're willing to follow him with everything that you are and do everything that he asks. And so with this first point, the question that we have to ask ourselves is this, are you following Jesus? Because you're not just wanted, you're called to follow You're called to follow him, and that includes using your gifts and abilities for him, even those that you don't think you have, letting Jesus shine through you. And it means doing what Jesus asks because you love him. That's what it means to follow. But that's not the only thing we're called to in this passage. We're actually called to another thing, and that is that we are called to call. We are called to call. And so if we look at this, Jesus didn't just say, come follow me. He said that he was going to make them fishers of men. It wasn't just enough that they followed. There was a specific thing that they were to do when they followed. And that was to make them fishers of men. They were called to call others to follow Jesus. In fact, if we look at John the Baptist, he called people to repentance and to Jesus In fact, whenever he was out in the crowd, out in the wilderness, he called people to Jesus. He understood this aspect of the calling. He understood that it wasn't enough just for him to follow God. He knew that he had to preach. He had to proclaim who God was and proclaim that other people needed to follow as well. This is not just inviting them to church, you need to understand. John the Baptist wasn't just inviting them to the temple so the priests could do their job. The disciples weren't just inviting someone to come hear Jesus speak. They were doing something. You see, it wasn't just a one-time thing. It was an ongoing process. It was disciple-making. And it was something that each and every follower of Jesus was called to do, not just a preacher or the elders at the church, but every single Christian is called to be a fisher of men. We see this in Matthew. If you turn in, if you see in your Bibles in Matthew chapter 28, if you're still at Mark 1, just flip the page over and go to the last chapter of Matthew there. And we see in Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20, Jesus gives this command, this great commission, you might say. And he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now we have to understand the grammar here. Jesus isn't asking, He's commanding. So if you love Him, you do what He commands, and He is commanding here. And he commands four things. He has four imperatives, if you know grammar. Four imperatives that he says, and it's go, make, baptize, teach. He didn't say this just to the church leaders. It was to the disciples as a whole. All those that followed him, all those that had been called, he made this command to. These imperative statements, go, you go find someone. Make you make them disciples. And how do you make them disciples? You baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and you teach them what it means to follow. You and me and everyone who follows Jesus is called to do this, not just inviting them to church and saying, hey, come listen to the preacher and sing some songs. By all means, do that too. Not saying don't do that, but know that it's more than that. It's called living life with others and showing them who Jesus is. You don't have to have it all figured out, but you just have to be able to say, this is what Jesus means to me. This is what I understand. This is why I follow him. And this is what I think it means to follow him. 
And if they see that in your life and they see that you truly are following them, they're going to be called to that as well. Because when a Christian is truly living the Christian life and loving Jesus and obeying his commands, it is something to behold that people are amazed by. And people will see that and be drawn like that, like a moth to a light. And they want to be a part of it as well. Over through all history, it's the reason why Christianity has grown in such hard times. Because people see the way that people react in the hard times, and they go, I want to be a part of someone who believes that strongly, and someone who in the face of persecution can love those that are persecuting them so deeply. I want to be a part of the person who's willing to die for their faith, but in all the time asking someone to forgive the people that are killing them. I want to be a part of something that when everyone else is leaving the lepers off to themselves and refusing to go near them, will actually risk getting leprosy themselves and go amongst them and take care of the lepers. I want to be a part of that. And throughout all of history, when we see the most growth in an area in the church, it's because the church is doing those things. They're taking the words of Christ seriously and people are drawn to that. They're living their life for God and they're showing people what it means to do so. Not because they just heard some preacher preach the word, but because they saw an individual be an example of what a disciple truly is. And that's what called them to follow. So the question here is, who have you called to follow? It's a question I have to ask myself and you have to ask yourselves, is have you actually called anyone to follow? Are you currently calling someone to follow Christ? It's not an easy thing always to do. Some people are more gifted at it than others. But as we've said in the last one, it's not about how gifted you are. It's about Jesus shining through you. And yes, some people might be gifted in this. I have witnessed people that are gifted in this that have told someone about Jesus in the freezer aisle of Walmart and had someone in tears and they took him back and baptized them that night. They didn't know them until they saw him in the freezer aisle. Most of us aren't that kind of gifted in this. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be doing it. The command was to all followers, not just those that are gifted in the art of evangelism. And so think to yourself, who is it that I should call to follow? Pray, who should I be calling? And then pray also, am I following the calling that Jesus had for me? Am I following after Jesus? Am I going in the direction I should be? Am I doing what he asks me to do? And am I calling others to do the same? That's the question we have to ask ourselves today. And that's when we read our scriptures as we're going through Mark, I pray and hope that you will see what Jesus is calling us to do over and over again through his life and through his teaching and I pray that you will do the same as we read through the next 10 weeks in Mark. Let us pray. Dear Father, we are grateful that you sent your son to die on the cross for our sins. We are grateful that you have called us to something bigger than ourselves. And I pray that each and every one of us will take up that calling and take it seriously and try to spread your message to all those around us. I pray this in your son's holy name. Amen.